He's responsible for maintaining peace in Europe. But can he resolve the region's longest running conflict before his term ends? I'm Maria Ramos and today's newsmaker is the OSCE Secretary General Thomas Greminger. His job title could easily read Europe's head of security. As Secretary General of the world's largest regional security organization, Thomas Greminger's responsibilities are vast and varied, monitoring everything from human rights, elections, gender equality and the economy, all while finding a way to keep the 57 member states talking. But that's proving particularly difficult uh, when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, as the war along their border seems a long way from being resolved. Another point of contention is the appointment of the Albanian Prime Minister, Edi Rama, as the body's new chairman, which has raised more than a few eyebrows. So to speak about these challenges and more, we have the Secretary General of the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Thomas Greminger, who joins us now from Vienna. Great to have you on the show. Um, so your, um, your term ends in six months' time in July. Uh, tell us what's on your achievement list, uh, success list, but also on your to-do list. Clearly, um, managing conflicts in the OEC area is uh, top uh, of uh, the OEC agenda. And here, as a Secretary General, uh, my uh, main respons responsibility is to support the negotiation formats that the OEC has, uh, be it uh, regarding Ukraine, be it uh, regarding the transition settlement uh, process, uh, uh, or uh, the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict, uh, or the conflict uh, dealt with by the uh, Geneva International Discussions, that is uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, I, I think we've been uh, fairly successful in managing uh, these conflicts, in containing them, in alleviating uh, human suffering. This is particularly true also for, uh, for Ukraine. We haven't uh, been particularly successful in moving uh, them towards resolution, uh, but here I would also uh, argue that uh, this is uh, very much uh, then a matter, uh, a function of the political will uh, of uh, the parties uh, to a conflict, uh, uh, while uh, an international organization like the OEC uh, is uh, uh, tasked to be as responsive as possible okay. to a changing uh, political environment. And uh, with regards to Ukraine, um, in particular, of course, uh, East Ukraine, you say uh, you haven't been particularly successful. But, you know, I ask, this is uh, the worst ongoing conflict in Europe, uh, more than 10,000 people dead, almost daily shelling. Um, has your organisation actually done anything to improve the situation there? I would argue that we've been uh, successful in containing uh, the conflict over the last uh, uh, five years. Uh, we've been uh, successful in alleviating uh, human suffering uh, to uh, uh, quite an extent. I would refer to the ceasefires, these uh, local windows of silence that we've been uh, constantly organizing, more than a thousand uh, uh, last year, uh, which, you know, has a, a very uh, uh, decisive impact on the quality of life of four million people on both sides of the line of contact, because uh, this allows to repair uh, um, uh, transmission lines, um, uh, water supply systems, etc. So in that sense, we've been successful. Now, uh, when it comes to resolving the conflict uh, politically, uh, I would point, point to a new uh, political dynamic that we've uh, been uh, observing since last uh, summer. There is a new political impulse uh, coming 
from the Normandy uh, Four Group, uh, that is uh, uh, France, uh, Germany, the Russian Federation, and Ukraine. And, and since last summer, uh, I think we have uh, clearly uh, notable progress when it comes to uh, successful disengagement, industry pilot disengagement areas. We have seen uh, an exchange of uh, detainees uh, in September and now again on the 29th uh, of uh, December. Uh, so we have seen uh, a number of confidence building measures implemented. Uh, uh, I think we have uh, seen a, a successful Paris summit in December that calls for additional uh, disengagement uh, areas, that calls for uh, more demining, uh, that calls okay. for additional uh, measures to strengthen the ceasefire. Um, uh, uh, there is work ongoing for uh, yet another exchange of detainees. So I think uh, there is, since last summer, clearly uh, a new, uh, a much more conducive dynamic towards implementing the Minsk agreements. OK, but there still is, uh, there still are ceasefire violations violations uh, from your daily reports nearly every single day. So progress, but still violations uh, daily, you'd say? That, that's correct. Uh, the ceasefire violations are still uh, way too high. They uh, did calm down since last summer. Uh, over the last few weeks, they've been relatively uh, low with occasional uh, spikes, but it's true we still have not achieved uh, a sustainable ceasefire, and this is uh, clearly a challenge. Uh, we've been, again, uh, relatively successful in bringing down civilian casualties. That They've come down uh, massively over the last uh, 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 three years, so, uh, so that's positive. But, okay. of course, there is still a long way to go, absolutely. I want to ask you about your, your nationality. Being a uh, Swiss, has this helped um, in being perceived as being, being neutral in negotiations? Well, g given uh, current tensions, given uh, and again widening uh, east-west gap, it's clearly uh, no disadvantage to come from a country that is not uh, perceived to have a regional agenda, that is perceived to be uh, neutral, impartial, uh, and that is also perceived to uh, offer uh, conflict uh, management expertise. Okay. So how would you say that helps um, the next chairman of the uh, OSCE, who is uh, Albania, and its Prime Minister, Eddie Rama, who takes over the chairmanship? Um, and this has been been quite controversial. Even some media reports have even um, called it not only ironic, but a pure hypocrisy, uh, considering the allegations against him of corruption and eroding uh, democracy and free speech. So what would your message be to critics? I would argue that uh, it is uh, quite an achievement uh, for a country like Albania to chair uh, a regional uh, organization of the size of the OEC. Uh, if you see where Albania comes from, then you can only be impressed uh, about what has been achieved in a relatively short time. Clearly, chairing the OEC is, is a huge challenge, uh, uh, also for countries, you know, that uh, are much uh, bigger than Albania. I would see uh, clearly an opportunity for um, a win-win outcome, both for the organization and for Al Albania. Uh, Albania, as you uh, allude to, is clearly uh, challenged by uh, a, a number of security challenges that uh, the OEC uh, uh, deals with, uh, um, preventing violent extremism, countering uh, terrorism, uh, fighting uh, corruption, uh, is establishing um, um, democratic uh, institutions, uh, mm -hmm. strengthening the rule of law, etc. In, in that sense, uh, I think Albania can at the same time bring in its own experiences in uh, tackling, uh, in dealing with But what uh, about Eddie Rama issues. himself? Uh, the Prime Minister uh, launched uh, the Albanian chairmanship uh, last week here in Vienna. 
Uh, and uh, I can tell you uh, this uh, was a very powerful, a very impressive uh, a launch. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister is very committed uh, uh, also to invest uh, uh, political capital uh, in uh, chairing the OEC. And uh, while you need, of course, a strong diplomatic team here in Vienna uh, that runs, I would say, 70 to 80 uh, percent of uh, the challenges of, of chairing the OEC, uh, I think it is important to have a prime minister uh, that is ready to come in when uh, political support uh, is needed, when you need to uh, pick up uh, the phone and call colleagues of here, uh, yours uh, in capitals uh, to uh, make the final push uh, to get a, a consensus decision uh, achieved. And uh, I want to ask you, do you think uh, your organization, the OSCE, is still relevant in this day and age? I think we are uh, extremely relevant, but perhaps uh, we are uh, coming back to uh, what we uh, did mainly in the first years uh, of our existence. Uh, when we started out as the conference uh, um, on security and cooperation in Europe, uh, when we uh, tried to manage uh, tensions between uh, the East and West. And uh, given uh, the current uh, challenges, uh, uh, the current tensions, uh, again, uh, between East and, and West, you need a platform for inclusive dialogue. And, and I would argue that the OEC is, uh, if not uh, at least one, if not the last uh, remaining platform, where you can dis discuss security challenges with everybody in the OEC area sitting at the same uh, table, uh, be it uh, you know political military issues okay. uh, that and are again relevant in Europe, or be it counterterrorism, be it uh, um, combating um, cyber threats, uh, trafficking of all uh, sorts. I think uh, indeed. Uh, we are uh, more relevant uh, than ever. OK, and, and, and on that point, because you did touch on it, what do you think uh, is the most concerning for peace uh, for Europe right now? Is it cyber attacks? Is it the, uh, the, uh, the coming back of uh, former Daesh uh, militants to Europe? Is it Russia? What would you say it is? I think, uh, you know, what makes it so challenging is that it is a, a complex set of issues. Uh, we have uh, started our conversation uh, by talking about uh, Ukraine. Uh, when you look at the law of trust between key stakeholders of European security, uh, clearly Ukraine is a key uh, contributor. We still have uh, protracted uh, conflicts in, in Europe. But against uh, the backdrop of these conflicts, we are facing transnational threats, and you have alluded uh, to uh, some of them, uh, terrorism, uh, violent extremism, uh, but also more and more uh, cyber-related uh, issues, um, cyber threats stemming from state actors, but also uh, cyber uh, crime. We are confronted with trafficking. And then what we see is a, a, a new uh, emerging set of security issues that are related to climate change. What are the repercussions of climate change on security in the OEC area? And then, of course, a rapid technological change. Uh, just imagine uh, the impact of artificial intelligence uh, on all aspects uh, of our comprehensive approach to security. So um, it's also these uh, challenges that we will have to uh, deal with uh, in the years to come. All right, Thomas Greminger, we are, thank you so much for joining us on The Newsmakers, and we wish you uh, the best of luck with the rest of your term. In South Sudan, there are signs the world's newest country is moving one step closer to peace following a recent meeting at the Vatican. Leaders who hadn't been a part of the previous peace deal have agreed to a tentative date for a truce. 
And this comes a year uh, after failed attempts to reach an accord and follows a series of fresh U.S. sanctions, this time aimed at the country's vice president for alleged human rights abuses. It's the latest sign that Washington, once a key supporter, is re-evaluating its relationship with the country's leadership. Adam Pletz reports. The U.S. Treasury Department has placed sanctions on South Sudan's vice president, Taban Dengue. Washington says he arranged the murder of opposition leaders. The U.S. withdrew its ambassador in November and has also sanctioned other government officials. It says the measures aim to pressure politicians in the world's youngest nation to form a unity government. The U.S. is committed to protecting human rights and determined to promote the accountability are the South Sudan peace process spoilers. Credible leaders should make all necessary compromises to build a framework for peace in South Sudan. Tabandeng replaced Riek Machar as first vice president in 2016. Machar had been accused of a coup attempt and was originally removed from office by President Salva Kiir in 2013. That sparked an ethnically fueled civil war between supporters of Kiir and Machar which has left hundreds of thousands dead and displaced millions. Peace talks led to Mashar's short-lived return to the vice presidency in 2016, before fighting broke out again. An internationally sponsored agreement should have seen the formation of a unity government in November 2019, but disagreement over the integration of armed forces, among other issues, resulted in a 100-day extension to the negotiations. We have agreed to form the government after the 100-day schedule without any more delays. We have also agreed to set up a fund from the oil revenue to support the peace deal. The government in Juba says US sanctions only impede an already difficult peace process. In a positive development, on Tuesday, splinter rebel groups, which had not previously signed the truce, agreed to join the process. After years of conflict, will South Sudan meet the new February deadline for the formation of a unity government? And do the U.S. sanctions help or hinder the process? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. To discuss this, let's go to our guests. And from Juba, I'm joined by President Salva Kiir's spokesman, Ateni Wek Ateni. And in London is South Sudan's political analyst, Mawan Mortat. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Um, Ateni, I'd like to go to you first. Tell us just how much pressure are the U.S. sanctions putting uh, you under? And is this pressuring you to form a unity government finally? Uh, in fact, uh, the sanctions that the United States of America is living against uh, uh, South Sudan political leaders, uh, and particularly the one that uh, was recently uh, uh, passed uh, or uh, decreed by the United States against the first uh, vice president of the Republic of South Sudan was extremely unfortunate, given that, uh, the, you know, Taban Dengai is uh, central to the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement on a solution of conflict in the Republic of South Sudan. And he's helping President Salva Kiir uh, to arrive at uh, a better conclusive implementation of uh, the peace agreement or a solution of conflict. By sanctioning him, uh, it is not only uh, footing the pressure, but uh, it is actually pushing people to believe that the United States of America is driving an agenda, which is not very much helpful to the, peace, the implementation of peace agreement. Because um, if the leaders in Cuba uh, becomes like, you know, frightened uh, uh, with uh, the sanctions against them, uh, they will not be able to give an informed or uh, a a, a, an informed decisions uh, that uh, will, will make them to implement. But um, Ateni, uh, um, the uh, US properly. could argue they have spent on South Sudan 11 uh, billion US dollars since independence and 400,000 people have died, 4 million displaced. Uh, maybe their patience is, is running out. But I want to put a question to you, uh, Mawan. Um, can the people of South Sudan afford 
uh, more delay with a peace process because the UN says the country is on the verge of famine. Absolutely, we've always been on the verge of famine because our people are not able to settle and uh, cultivate. Uh, people have not seen the uh, benefit of peace dividends since 2005. Uh, people have sacrificed, had sacrificed for many, many decades for deliberation, and unfortunately, this war has stopped. So the pressure on our leaders to bring peace is immense. Uh, people are tired on both sides. Nobody wants to fight anymore. We welcome all the progress that is happening now, and we hope that the peace should come as soon as possible. There's no way that the people can wait any longer. Ateni, you hear that. Um, and do you think that that February deadline is going to be uh, adhered to? What are the guarantees? Well, today we have uh, left with only 27 days to, to go. Uh, uh, for, for us, in the office of the president, uh, that meaning I'm representing the president in this matter, uh, the president doesn't want uh, more extensions. He wanted uh, the, the uh, revitalized transitional government of national unity formed on the 12th of February. Uh, he has uh, met with Dr. Oriak today uh, to discuss the remaining uh, security issues, and they have actually postponed uh, the talk today as you know, pending further, you know, uh, uh, consultation uh, with, with their uh, uh, parties or with their colleagues uh, before they come back to meet again under the auspices of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the first vice president. So what does that the, mean, the first, um, Ateni? Sorry, uh, just to clarify, the 12th of February deadline, will that uh, deadline for peace be met, yes or no? Uh, yes, it will be met. Okay. Uh, as I'm telling you from the side of the president, that uh, the president is ready to form the government. If uh, the, uh, the, the, the parties to agreement agree on the 12th uh, of, uh, uh, of, of February okay. deadline, there's no problem to form the peace. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, to you, Mawan, uh, we've seen uh, many deadlines missed before. Are you confident of this uh, February 12th deadline? No, it seemed very short to me because there are still a couple of contentious issues. Obviously, at the moment, they are murky. We do not understand uh, the details of what is still outstanding. Um, but if there was more clarity, we should we would be able to be more certain whether it's going to be met or not. But it looks that they are still um, further apart than we hoped. We OK, uh, and at any last year, the U.S. State Department said the following um, South Sudan's president, Salva Kiir's government is no longer suitable to continue leading the country's peace process. Um, are you able to prove them wrong now in 2020? No, I think so. Even uh, when this statement uh, was released, it was a very uninformed, uh, you know, uh, position, uh, simply because uh, 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 this government, and particularly the government of President Salva Kiir, is very much suitable to govern this country. And if uh, not because uh, those who make decisions on, you know, on, on which government suits or not, uh, not aware of the real situation in the country, they would not even be talking about uh, the, the suitability. Because without President Salva Kiir, as I speak with you, uh, the country will even slip to more chaos. And therefore, the suitability has never uh, ceased to exist. OK, uh, we have a minute to go. Mawan, uh, the suitability. Of course, there's a road, uh, road, mark, uh, road map here. There is no really a case for uh, regime change or substitution leadership. That has not helped us elsewhere in the world. But there is a, a road map here in this peace process. So as soon as the national government of unity is created, as soon as it's created, the soon we will be able to open the gates to the subsequent elections in three years, where the South Sudanese will be able to choose their own leaders among all the leaders available and the ones that we yet have not heard about. OK, uh, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us here on the, on the uh, uh, newsmakers. Ateni Wekateni and Mawan Mortat, uh, thank you very much for your time and your comments. Really appreciate it.
يجلب السلام ولن يجلب الاستقرار هذا الحائط حائط عنصري حائط غير حضاري حائط غير سياسي حائط غير إنساني إذا أردنا أن نتعايش يجب أن يزال هذا الحصار That's all we have time for on this edition of the Newsmakers. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, thanks for your company. And we'll see you next time on the Newsmakers here on TRC. Bye-bye.